hello there, my name is PJ and I'm coming to you from a place called the future. Welcome to the show. This is a new weekly podcast that I'm going to be doing with my friend Kurt Thompson, aka Kurtogram. We are two full-time working photographers, commercial photographers, I guess you might say, who've taken very different paths in the field. Kurt has sort of built his business around like lifestyle um, brands and content. He does a lot of like sport, fashion, food product um wedding he works with his partner cara who shoots and edits as well me on the other hand i am a little bit more risk averse personality wise and i traded that sort of freedom for some stability in my life i work nine to five for someone else i have like a monday to friday nine to five photography job um which has been great and yeah maybe the content is a little bit less sexy a little bit more sort of like bread and butter sort of reliable Um, consistent stuff we do a lot of commercial property um, corporate aerial video Um, we do do a bit of everything but yeah that's sort of like our our staple week to week anyway basically this show is just a platform that i can use to get out all of the ideas that i have that don't quite lend themselves to the traditional video format in my apple notes app for example or up here on my whiteboard i just have all these ideas for content that i want to make but some of them just aren't as visually interesting, let's say, or just aren't as sort of like snappy. Um, It's not the sort of thing that someone would search up and click on in the YouTube algorithm, but I think it's really useful and interesting content nonetheless. And it just really lends itself to this podcast format, whether it's sort of like the informal nature or the fact that I can have a discussion with someone else and hear a different point of view. Um, Kurt is someone I really trust and admire and respect and, you know, we've taken quite different paths and so I think we have um, similar but um, also different perspectives on uh, on certain topics. With all that being said, this is, I suppose, what you'd call the pilot. We're still figuring out the format. This episode is really to figure out like the technical side of things. Kurt, of course, is up in Queensland. I'm down here in Melbourne and there are certain challenges when doing this remotely, um, but I think it turned out really well. It's a bit of a long one. I hope you enjoy it. I would love to... Once you're done listening to this, I would love it if you could leave me some feedback down below, what you liked, what you didn't like, what we could improve, all that sort of thing. Um, But yeah, this is going to be a new weekly podcast starting this week. I hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's get into the show. So how do we start? The uh, what what you probably didn't see off camera was the half an hour it just took us to fiddle around with all all the um, bits and pieces and we're a little bit behind our starting schedule but I think this is going to work I think from my end it's looking good from what I can see from your end it's uh, super pro so I'm pretty pumped well I mean the, I don't know if the color means pro it just means it looks looks a bit more uh, shiny and sparkly right. I mean, on the on the webcam, it just looks all pink, but I'm sure from the proper camera, it's looking hot. Yeah, 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 a bit different. Um, how are you, mate? What's news? Um, I guess up here in Queensland, um, there is no lockdown, so uh, everything's kind of st- still fairly normal up here. Um, a lot of shoots and stuff have been going ahead, but um, we've had a couple that have been postponed and cancelled. Um, due to, you know, a mini Queensland lockdown. Um, I wouldn't even call it that, you know. Um, but yeah, that, that's about it. So it's pretty much business as normal. Um, and just, I guess I can't really travel interstate or overseas for work. Um, well, I haven't been able yet to for the last, you know, 12 months. So it's and a bit different um, lifestyle now. From what I've seen, you're shredding for the wedding pretty hard. Yeah, well, the plan was to actually shred and go to the gym, um, but yeah, Cara had um, an operation, like a major operation, a, a couple of months ago, and then from there, I guess I haven't really motivated either of us to to go back, you know. So we've taken a bit of time, I've had some family stuff kind of happened, and um, yeah, so now I'm just starting to run because it's uh, it's easier than going to the gym because you can go at any time, and um, as long as you have a spare you know, a couple of minutes, so then you can just kind of uh, get that going. I mean, if there's any two people that I know who who need to shred less for their wedding, I think it's you guys. You guys are <laughs> two, 
I hope you don't mind me saying two of the most attractive. You know, you guys are a literal power <laughs> couple. So, uh, you know, <laughs> when's the wedding? Two weeks? Just over two weeks? Yeah, it like is. That? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, the plan with the running was uh, my best mate, Liam, I kind of just challenged him to 200 Ks in 100 days, uh, which doesn't sound too much. But the only problem is we didn't start this challenge until probably 40 days in. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> as each day goes past... The, the amount of Ks we have to uh, do each day is more. So, yeah, it's been kind of tough um, trying to get those Ks out now with, with little time to go. Well, I hope it's getting easier because it looks like you're, um, it looks like you're sticking with it. Uh, and that's a really good segue, actually, to the first thing that I wanted to talk about. Did you ever meet Jeremy Lewis? Do you remember Jeremy X Lewis? Um, yeah, yeah. We used yeah. to do some stuff on YouTube together, him and I. Um, out of the you know completely randomly in preparation for this i went um and looked over we used to do just a little sit down and talk thing kind of like this on his channel ages ago just we were trying to pump out three videos a week each we had a bit of a challenge with each other um similar to what Liam, you and liam have with your running and yeah um what i wanted to talk about first because it's super relevant for me at the moment is what do you do things that we do in our lives to be the best version of ourselves um and that sort of sounds cheesy but what i mean is what can you do i've been really working on my mornings lately because i find if i can get things if i can set things up in the right order and if i get into my routine the rest of my day goes really well um, there's a bunch of things I want to talk about around that. I, I want to ask you some questions around that. Um, but certainly having someone else involved to keep you accountable and to have some competition, that is something really big that has worked for me in the past. And I can only assume that that is probably the number one factor for you having run over a hundred Ks in the last couple of yeah. weeks, whatever it's been. Yeah. Um, yeah, do you, exactly. Do you have any... Your schedule, from what I can see, is very busy and very sporadic. Do you have any um, rituals or routines that you do on a work day or on, on a regular day that sort of set you up to to just crush your days? Because, yeah, I almost don't know anyone who's been busier than you this year, from what I can yeah. see. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that is the thing, I think... Um, yeah, a routine definitely would help. Um, and also having other people to, I guess, push you, it helps as well. And and sometimes, you know, uh, physically and mentally, it's it's probably easier to get someone to, to push you. But pr creatively or, you know, what you did with Jeremy it is probably tougher as well because just trying to be creative on the drop of a hat, it can be e easy in, in some uh, instances. But then other times, like it's a real struggle, you know, to try and put together even a video a week, um, you know, to find that content or to talk about something or that you're interested in or something that's inspiring you, it's, it's going to have those lulls, you know, and it's, I guess it's the same with physical exercise. Like I know everyone's uh, on board with, with like the more exercise at the moment, A, because that's the only thing you're allowed to do with these current lockdowns. Um, and B, it's, it's meant to, yeah, meant to be good for your health. So I think everyone's trying to get on board with that, but it's okay if you don't as well. Like you don't, yeah, it's just really hard to, I guess, if you see someone pushing, like they, they could either inspire you or just totally like go the other way, be the opposite. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah exactly. It could be like, Oh, I can't run that far. I don't know. I'm not even going to try. So um, but for me, I think the routine that I that I have each morning is because Cara and I work together. We'll get up, and she likes to uh, get a coffee in the morning. You know, so that's how we start our day. We both jump in the same car, go to the coffee place, get our coffee, and we'll just get takeaways, and then we'll come home, and then I guess tackle the day. Or you know, if Cara's editing all day, I might be out shooting or whatever the situation is. So I think it might be really annoying year, and, and um, stop you stop you there, Kurt. Uh, every step of the yeah. way, I want to go. I want to like go, you know, microscopic. What what yeah. time does this start? What time are you generally 
waking up and what time does this, yeah. this ritual start? And it, so th- this is the thing. It, I, th- I think that your ritual changes on your workflow as well because some weeks I'll have to be up at 6 a.m. call times and then other weeks it'll be 10 a.m. So I'm, I've found it really hard to actually have a ritual um, within the last six months, I would say, mm. uh, just because of the amount of work that I've actually taken on as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard because some nights, you know, I'll be up editing to 2 a.m. and then I've got to be up at 6 a.m. the next day. Or, you know, I'll be in bed by 10 p.m. and then I might wake up at 9 a.m. the next day. Mm. So for me, there probably isn't a ritual and that's something that I would love to have, but it's really hard to manage with just, yeah, the inconsistency of, of times, I, I reckon. It's the, mm. it's the, um, it's a trade-off really because you get the freedom of, you know, working your own hours, deciding what jobs to take and, mm-hmm. and what not to. And yeah, in many ways, that's something that a lot of people would, you know, that's, that's the goal for a lot of people, um, including myself. I'd yeah. love to have that level of freedom, but on the other side of the coin, yeah. you know, at, at a certain point, the routine is, it's almost a different kind of freedom because it's like, it's a bunch of decisions you don't have to make. You just get up and you can just rinse and repeat or you can, you know, you know that you'll have your weekends or, or that sort of thing. So I guess there's always there's always a trade-off there. Um, so if, let's just say, I know there's no typical day for you, but let's say you guys get up at, whatever it is, seven, eight o'clock, you guys go grab your coffee, um, share that together, I guess. What happens next? Then, yeah, I'll come home and, you know, either pack my van or or I would have packed it the night before just with gear Um, because a lot of the times it's not just a camera, one camera and one lens, you know. A lot of times it's a bit more complicated than that, you know, lighting setups um, or video gear as well. So for me, it'll be come home, grab the stuff I need and then obviously, you know, allow enough time for me to get to location or wherever it is. So I live halfway between the Gold Coast and Brisbane. So either way, it's probably about 40 minutes um, to where I need to be usually. So yeah, it's, it's just trying to manage that time and I guess be on time, yeah. Is there anything that you do... Um, is there anything that you do amongst this chaos, you know, amongst the fact that it's changing and um, you're up late and up early or whatever? Is there anything that you can do to create order within the chaos? You know, like what do you do? Let's say you've got a long drive, what are you listening to? Or, um, you know, is there anything, uh, it could be your running or, or anything like that. I, For me personally, one thing that's really important to me is to, in any way that I can just remove the chaos from my life because Mm. sometimes you can't control it but the things that you can control for me it's really important to just try and find find try and find peace amongst all that chaos for sure and I well for me personally I think it is that if I do have a spare hour somewhere um, I will just try to go to to the golf course and and just do a bit of practice Um, and for me that's it's crazy. It does. It just clears my head, and it feels like, yeah, it's it's kind of like everything. Just nothing exists at that time. Like um, I used to surf a lot, and I think that had the same effect. Um, I don't know whether it's escaping, like just rather than dealing with stuff, but it's um, yeah, I definitely can put my mind at ease, you know. And I'll just listen to um, some kind of playlist on Spotify, just for an hour, like. Um, I'm not on the course as much as I used to be because of the influx of work. So for me, you know, a normal round of golf would be four to five hours. Whereas mm. now I, I don't have that time to commit. And I guess it'll be the same, you know, when, eventually when I have kids, it'll be, you know, minimal time to, to get that kind of, um, you know, free space in your head and yeah. just in your routine. So I think that's that's a way for me to you know just just before dark usually i'll go out you know so if it's like five o'clock until 5 30 or six o'clock um it's just you know i guess people if if they live you know 
they might go for walks on the beach or they might, you know, walk their dog in the afternoon. I guess it's that kind of wind down for the day until it turns into night. But um, the chaos doesn't stop for me <laughs> for me there. It's like the night time, it still works. So um, at least it gives me that. It's almost like a, a break because uh, I don't really have lunch breaks or anything like that. It's usually if you're shooting all day, you might just go from one job to the next job or and whatever it, whatever it is but yeah I think it, it's important to have those I guess hobbies you know whether you're painting Warhammer or you're gaming or, or whatever it is I, I feel like that you just need that little bit of a split time like um, I remember when NBA 2K21 or 20 came out whatever it was I was so excited because that could be my you know my half an hour of um downtime but but then to play what that game it took like 45 minutes to play just a, a match so i was like oh this is yeah it was too long so yeah you know, i stopped playing it just yeah yeah that's but yeah uh, is, is there anything that i guess your workflow is is different um you know i guess you have set times like you, you know, nine to five or eight to four or and do, so, do you get breaks or is, is there anything that you do to clear your head or, or just to feel un, uncluttered, I guess? Well, my day is a, I'm at the office. I mean, at the moment, we're not really shooting. So um, I'm at the office every day now, but yeah, my true. work day is yeah. 8.30 till 5.30. Um, yeah. And usually there's an hour break. Um, which in some ways is a bit annoying because if you've just got, you know, your sandwich or your whatever in the fridge, like you don't need an hour to eat it. But I think no. the, uh, yeah. the point is that it keeps me around in case there's something, you know, in case we have a dusk shoot that evening or there's a uh, event, uh, you know, a corporate event that yeah. night or, or something, it keeps me around a bit longer. So I, I sort of understand that that's sort of part of it. Um, I guess uh, I think I think it's a legal thing too. Um, for a lot of workplaces, you have to have an hour. Like I've shot with a bunch of agencies where we've legally had to have that, that hour break. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not it could sure be if it's an hour as well. I think it's like. Yeah. I think it's like. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's different. It's really hard for our industry because there's no, there's no awards for the photography industry. There's no. Um, uh, do you know what I mean when I say awards? There's no yeah, I know uh, yeah, uh, yeah. There's unions, no award, there's award no, rate, and yeah, and it doesn't yeah, yeah yeah. So it is it is different, and it's a bit difficult for our industry. Um, I suppose I'll take you through my morning quickly um, because I feel like that's much more interesting than my day, um, and. <laughs> I just know, I just have these like series of things that I can tick off. And if I can do that in the morning, then the rest of my day is easy. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I suppose for you, where do you find your, are you a morning, afternoon, night person? What's your, what's that sweet spot for your creative brain? Like when, when do you work the best? Yeah. When I work the best is honestly from like 10 p.m to like 2 a.m yeah with a complete it's, opposite. Um, yeah it's 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 really hard for me like if i'm at a do uh you know sunrise shoot it's like i just don't talk until it's like 10 a.m you know yeah. so it's it's really hard for me to be energetic but as soon as i'm you know on i'm on but yeah it's it's really hard for me that's why if i have a choice usually um I'll chat to the client and say, hey, look, you know, 10 a.m. start, it'll be perfect. You know, the light's good at this time and yeah. whatever it is, you know, you just try and always, I'm always saying, um, you know, sunset's better than sunrise, but that's probably because uh, I don't like getting up early. Yeah. 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 So, well, I'm the complete opposite for, for some reason between, let's say, 7 and 11 a.m. or like even even just seven to 10, I feel like I can get a day's worth of work done. You know, three hours, I can get yeah. more than yeah. I can do eight hours on the back back half of the day. Um, there's just, for me, there's just this certain like 
there's something so peaceful about the morning. Like as much as getting up and getting out of bed sucks, being up yeah. so early and feeling like you've accomplished something before 10 o'clock, it is just one of the best feelings for me. Um, so yeah. my mornings, uh, I've for the last month, I've been very, very strict on this. Um, I'm up between 5.30 and 6. And I say between because I have... Um, I have an app called Sleep Cycle. I'm not sure if you've heard of Sleep Cycle. Yeah. But yeah, it's yeah. basically you set a window for it to wake you up. You say, okay, if six o'clock is the latest that I can be awake, then basically it'll it can it picks up like movement and sound and it'll find when your body is in its lightest phase of sleep and then it'll slowly yeah, fade right. in an alarm. So wow. weirdly it really it feels like you're lying in bed and you're waiting for the alarm to go off and it goes off because it can tell mm. when your body is more awake. So yeah, that's that's, so that's how I start my day. It's a little bit more of a gentle start than a regular just iPhone alarm or whatever. But that's been really important yeah, to me. Yeah. And I've used that for no joke, like five or six years. And I have all of that data yeah. of all of my sleep from almost every night. So I can literally look yeah. at the patterns and what's worked and when I was sick and, and whatever. Yeah, um, true. So um, through a little bit of uh, data, I've sort of worked out that that's my sweet spot. Actually, for me, kind of the morning r routine has to start the night before. I've, If I want to have a great day, I've got to be in bed by like 9, 30, 10 o'clock the latest. And yeah. um, for me, the best thing that I can do is put down in writing what the three most important things that I have to do tomorrow because I find it's so much easier to wake up if you have a purpose to wake up for. Whereas if if you wake up just to think, I'm gonna wake up and be productive, it's just like so easy to roll over because there's not actually anything set in stone. Yeah. It's like, if you yeah, don't I do agree. that, there's, there's no consequence. But if it's like, okay, I have to finish this video by nine o'clock and I have to, um, I've got a meeting with this person at 10 or whatever, if, if I have that, out of my brain and onto some paper um, before I wake up, then for me, I can almost jump out of bed. Um, so yeah, that's really yeah. important for me. And at the moment, um, because of lockdown, it means I'm sitting at a desk all day. So I've actually tried, I'm trying to not do any work before work because otherwise just like my neck and back and head, like I'm just in a world of pain by the end of the day. but Usually that is when I would do my YouTube. Um, I'd have about one and a half to two hours of, of editing and that sort of thing before I need to go to work. So um, that's my most productive time between like let's say 7 and 8.30. At the moment, I um, have a glass of lemon water. I don't know why. I saw someone else do it. It seemed really zen and <laughs> it's just become my little habit now. I, it's kind of gross. but um, No, I reckon to, that's delicious. To yeah. drink a whole glass, like literally skull a whole glass of lemon water. Um, you you don't think about food for the next hour or so and it just like fully rehydrates you. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the first thing I do. Then I've got like uh, just this little like series of exercises and stretches I just do for my posture and whatever. I have, uh, I have um, semi-frequent like uh, migraines and, and those sort of issues. So I do my stretches, make sure I'm all good for the day. A couple of little breathing exercises, a bit of a uh, Wim Hof action. And then I, I'm, I'm yeah, good. The, yeah. rest the, the rest of the day is easy after that. Yeah. Um, so it's... See, that's the thing. I, uh, I, I do um, hear of people, you know, e even you just saying a couple of these things now. It's like, yeah they would just be such healthy um, habits to get into, you know, and and everyone always makes excuses for, for the lack of time that we have because, you know, everyone's always busy. Um, but it's like, yeah, that half an hour of, say, stretching and just that kind of routine, you know, hydrating, all those things, it, it can just, it obviously makes your day so much better than before you did it, you know. It's the sort of thing where sometimes... I've literally done it every single day for at least the last five or six weeks. Um, yeah. But it's just one of those things that if I don't do, I've just worked out and 
it's probably not good because I'm going to have to figure out a way to get into the groove if I don't do that stuff. But I've just worked out if I can mm. do those things in that order. And it's now at the point where I don't have to think about it. I get up and I can just do that. But if I can, if I can do that and get that win for the day, then just like my mental space for the rest of the day is just completely different. Um, yeah. Anyway, sorry, that was a little bit of a tangent, but uh, that was something that I wanted to talk about because this was one of the things that I spoke about with Jeremy like four years ago when we did this. And it was so mm. funny to look back at how different it was. Um, I pretty how sure how different I your said, routine was, I guess. Yeah, yeah. There was like yeah. uh, I was still trying to do things in the morning, but my recipe for success was to wait up, wake up at eight a.m. and and um, I was just like, that just doesn't sound like a very successful person. I've got to make sure I'm awake by eight a.m. Yeah. every day. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, I'm a big uh, big nerd about that sort of stuff. Have you ever heard of yeah. um, a guy called Tim Ferriss? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, a lot of people have recommended me, you know, his, I don't know, he had a book, or a couple of books, so I don't know, yeah. Um, yeah. The 24 hour something, is that it? Yeah, or the four hour five work. hour something, I don't know, yeah. whatever. Yeah, it is, yeah, yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, he's been a big hero of mine. So he's uh, he's constantly like tinkering with those sort of things. He's just like trying to hack, yeah. hack the system like that. Yeah. Um, Anyway, for me, I just know that my sweet spot is in the morning and um, creatively, mentally, emotionally, you know, even borderline spiritually. It just, yeah. if, if I can get that sequence right, then I'm good for the rest of the day. Hmm. Anyway, let's, uh, leave, let's leave that there. I'm not sure uh, how interesting that is <laughs> to anyone watching, but for me, yeah, to I, anyone. I love that stuff. <laughs> Actually, just before we move on, I, I uh, forgot to check my notes. Do you have any bad habits? Bad habits? Um, yep, definitely. Uh, time management is is a big struggle for me. Um, b- before I had, you know, an influx of work or anything. So for me, you know, it's it's like, you know, I'll be five minutes late to a shoot or, you know, two minutes late to a shoot. It's like it's for some reason, even if I do set things to be earlier and I think I'm all, all good just for some reason time just like slips away and then you know I'm just not there at the, at the right time so if I'm like five minutes early to a shoot everyone's just like you know it's like a standing ovation when I walk in yeah um so that that would be the a bad habit I would say um and then also you know possibly just just getting, I guess, if you if I have a bunch of work, um, you know, I'm always drawn to work on the things that I guess I'm more passionate about first, you know. So rather than sequential, like what you know, if if there's a deadline Friday, but then there's something that's like due next Friday, and I like it more for some reason, you know, like I'm drawn to that because I'm so creative with like like oh this could be awesome, you know. So then I spend a day working on that and then it leaves me shorter amount of time for the deadline on Friday. So um, I think that's something that I need to work on personally and just, you know, understand that, hey, I can work on the stuff I'm more passionate about, but I just have to get out the other stuff first, you know. So because there's there's a lot of jobs and, you know, whether it's corporate or whatever it is where it might not be as interesting, you know, or, you know, yeah, it it could be anything, but I guess that's it's um something that I need to work on to to just be able to meet the deadlines, you know, um no matter what the job, I guess. Yeah. Um how much of that stuff can Cara take off your hands? So that's the thing. I think over the last year we've been ramping up to um I guess for Cara to literally be you know better than me that's that's the aim is like for her to probably learn other like things that I'm not good at Mm -hmm. and then so we have that balance um because there's no point in her learning the exact same skill set as me because yeah if if I can do it then I might as well do it so if Mm. if she can be better than me at certain things um well then it's gonna it's gonna be easier so 
that's the thing. Um, Cara edits all the wedding stuff now. Mm -hmm. Um, and with a bunch of other shoots and stuff, you know, she'll just, um, edit because obviously she's learned the style that I like and the style that she likes. And, um, that way we can have a bit of a chat about, you know, we can do uh, an initial grade and then if, if we're not both of us not happy or then we'll, um, we'll adjust it until we both are. And then from there, yeah, she can grade or edit whatever, um, so I guess that's the thing also with trying to ramp up uh, business and stuff like that. It's like we need to be able to have the ability to meet deadlines, to, you know, produce quality work without sacrificing anything. So, yeah. Yeah. Dream team. And that's, yeah. Well, man, honestly, that's the thing. I trust her wholly, you know, wholeheartedly that she's going to be able to do better than me. <laughs> and that's the thing, like, that there's been a lot of times where um, she's just got, you know, ama an amazing shot for, on the day or whatever it is. And it's like, oh, I did not even see that, you know. So, yeah, it's it's definitely, you know, say a year ago, it was probably just more me that was doing it. And then now it's like it's, it's, it's just a team effort, everything now. Excellent, excellent. What do you think about, um, I know for me, if I don't, it sucks because, okay, you've finished a day shooting or you've finished a wedding or a video or whatever, you get home. Obviously, the last thing you want to do is sit down on the computer, you know, organize it all, import it all, whatever. I find, weirdly, after a shoot, I'm the most motivated to at least look at the photos because I want to make sure that I've nailed the brief. I want to make sure it went as well yeah, as I thought it yeah. went, that sort of thing. I find if I if I don't at least make a start on that job there, I'll put it off until like like you say until it's due. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm exactly the same. Like I have to dump everything that same day, same night because there are times where um, you know you might accidentally not copy all the card over or you know not file it properly and then you're looking for something and it could be on a different hard drive or whatever it is. And I think that, um, if, yeah, if I, you're right, if I don't make a start on it that night or at least kind of for video, just put some kind of timeline or, you know, for the photos, at least have it all in, you know, a proper management system. Yeah. Dude, I won't touch it for like, in, yeah, till the week of that it's true. And, um, yeah, I don't think, I don't think that's a good thing. And it's, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, obviously, a lot of people must do so yeah yeah um social media mm. in terms of in terms of bad habits where do you fall on that spectrum i don't maybe my bad habit on social media is maybe not looking at what other people do enough you know to see what it's really hard because there's so much shit on there that it's like hard to for good things to stand out. So I don't find myself looking too much on social media. Like it's really hard for me to manage. And I think it's a full, full-time role um, in itself, like to manage your own social media or, or clients or your own company or whatever. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I have bad habits cause I don't really sit on there and scroll like, and I don't have TikTok and stuff like that. Like the main, the main source I guess for me is Instagram. Um, so yeah and that's the thing a lot of the time now it's just stories it's not really so much posts even so um yeah i think i think that's forever changing you know maybe a couple of years ago i think it was more i spent a lot more time looking at what people were doing um and that's that's not even to compare yourself it's just to try and find inspiration you know um which, which is hard because i guess I think where I find inspiration is probably more like billboards and, and ads rather than my social media. Um, yeah. I guess maybe that's be like, cause that's where I want to be. You know, I want to be doing billboards. I want to be doing commercial, you know, yeah. high, exactly. Yeah. Like high yeah. end ads and where you have a team of, you know, 20 people rather than, um, you know, hustling around just being a one man band. Like it's, it's just a different environment, different atmosphere. Like, 
you know, different budgets, different clients. Like it's, it's actually, yeah, a whole different game. Is Instagram for photographers? Um, I think it still is. There's a lot of good work out there, you know, because if it wasn't for photographers, where else is that that's, you know, that people aren't on Flickr anymore or, um, any, you know, Tumblr or, or whatever, wherever people used to, sh you know, share their, uh, images. So, and I, I know that they've done the current update to say that it's not a photo app anymore. It's, it's a video based app, but, um, yeah, where else? where else do photographers go to and you know can be exposed to that many people as well you know the audience is huge um it's a bigger audience than i think you're going to find anywhere else you know i um maybe maybe we see it differently because you have well i think you've always had a pretty you've always had a really solid um understanding of instagram but also you've just had a solid following and you know just like base on instagram um i honestly think for the most part um you're right if not instagram where else what else do photographers have and i wanted to do a podcast on this all on its own and the title of the yeah. podcast was going to be um photographers are homeless now because mm. there's in my opinion photos just don't look good on instagram to make a photo look good on instagram there's a sort of a very specific set of guidelines you have to follow you have to shoot vertical firstly if you don't shoot vertical it just doesn't look good um no. yeah there's i sort of liken it to i suppose i think about it i don't know if you know this but i i think like most ex-music photographers we were ex-musicians before we were photographers yeah um yeah i used to play in bands like long before i was into photography so i kind of draw a lot of parallels between those two and i kind of think of instagram now as um for anyone international watching watching in australia we have triple j which is the sort of alternative radio station um they do a lot to um they do a lot for independent artists and especially for Australian artists. But there's this weird phenomenon with Triple J where I feel like there's at least a subculture of bands that create f a sound for Triple J to be played on Triple J. And I think Instagram kind of has that self-fulfilling prophecy as well. I feel like Instagram is dictating what sort of photos go on Instagram rather than making a great picture and it posts it on Instagram, I feel like it's gotten to the point now where the formula is so, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not even that good at this, but to make a photo look good on Instagram and for a photo to perform well on Instagram and to reflect well on, on you and, and whatever else, I feel like there's this formula that you have to follow and that in itself, to me, is... I think that's a strike. I think that's that goes against photography. Did you ever use Flickr or, or 500 PIX, PX? Did you ever use any no, of those? No, no, because I didn't have a camera then. Yeah, <laughs> like, true. I, I, know, I know what they are. Um, yeah, is it 500 PX? I thought it was 300. I uh, must be wrong. But f it's say 500 PX, I remember going on there, and this is when I was early days, and it made me like literally just want to quit because the photography on 500 px was just so damn good it was like the best of the best you know so it was a great platform but the only thing i felt was it was just designed f by photographers for photographers so you're only catering to people who are already doing the job you know whereas instagram is kind of for everyone and maybe it's not like targeted for photographers but at least the audience is potential clients, you know, whereas 500 PX, I don't think many people are going on there looking for someone who could, you know, who they could hire, I guess. Um, and then Flickr, I, I'm not sure what, yeah, what that was all about. I think it was just like, oh, if you had a bunch of photos, you put up a gallery, you know. So I think both of those, both of those platforms definitely... 
as far as my memory serves, both of those platforms predate Instagram. And both of those platforms were around, I was really, really into Flickr when I first got into photography. I couldn't wait to, I remember thinking if I could go forward in time, I would go forward 10 years to check what I had posted on Flickr in the last 10 years. It was sort of like a, it was kind of like a diary, like a photographic diary. And I suppose that Instagram is that in a way, but it was, it was, you're right. It was a photo, uh, community for photographers. People weren't going on Flickr to find someone to hire. And I suppose, I guess that's where you and I differ on this because you probably generate a lot of your revenue, a lot of your business through Instagram. Um, and I don't, I often don't think of Instagram that way. And to be honest, like the last few years, I've neglected Instagram a lot and just photography in general. I think my own photography, I've neglected a lot, but um, I've thought about this a lot recently and I just don't understand why Instagram wouldn't work to make photos look beautiful on its platform. I don't mm. understand who who benefits. So I understand the argument of more photos are posted here every day than anywhere else on the planet or, or whatever else. But, you know, even if you look at Twitter, have you ever posted photos on Twitter? Rarely, that's the thing. I, I, I don't really use, I have a Twitter account, but it's usually just like a repost from Instagram or something. So I've never really looked at it, yeah. Photos look stunning is it, on is Twitter. Is it like a better? Yeah, right. Like stunning. Hmm. Um, even, I don't know if you remember, there was this thing, there was this bandwagon I jumped on five years ago for five seconds called Ello. Do you remember that one? Um, hey. Yeah. Is is uh, I remember e jumping on some platform and I thought it was going to be the best thing ever and I told yeah, everyone to download it. Me yeah, too, yeah, yeah. Cause, and then it turned out to be, I don't know, some bad dude running it or something. I think that's the one that I'm thinking of. I don't know about you, but yeah. I don't know about I'm any of that, but different. Yeah. it's just the, have you, have you heard of a term called the network effect? No. So the strength of, the strength of the, the platform or the product or the cryptocurrency or whatever comes from not necessarily the product, but the network. So if there's, yeah, yeah. You know, you can't beat fa Facebook is Goliath. You can't you can't beat Facebook because everyone is there. Every single like, yeah, yeah. Whether we want to or not, you know. And I, Gem and I make fun of it because it's we just say it's just for boomers now. Like it's just our parents' generation <laughs> that are commenting and posting all the time. But regardless, yeah, you, yeah. you and I are still on there. And you know, I yeah. As much as I wish I didn't, I still check it every day and whatever. So like how can you how can a new company come in now and take that from from facebook and yeah. so elo might have had the photos might have looked better and there was no advertising and there was a linear timeline and all of that stuff no algorithms yeah yeah um yeah. all of these features that were fantastic but it just didn't have the network so how could it compete yeah um yeah. anyway i'm getting a little bit off topic here but i just think instagram owes it to its users, not just photographers, to make photos look better. And I don't think it would be that hard. Like there's obviously a certain compression or, or whatever. And I guess it's the same on Facebook, but if it's, I think the reason they don't is because it's not a photography app anymore. It, it's about, it's about business now. I guess you're right. Mm. Maybe I'm complaining because I'm, it doesn't generate the sort of business for me that it does for you. Um, I'm just thinking out loud now, but I guess I've just never thought of it in, in that way. Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll leave that for now. Um, I'm kind of glad that we had a different view on that because I think I'm going to, I'm going to try and see it in a, in a bit of a different light now. Um, just on yeah. that, how, how much, if you had to give a percentage, how much would you say of your of your work does come through Instagram? Um, honestly, I would say hmm, as as little as twenty percent, and then maybe as high as forty. So, 
I, I think that's still a, a large amount. Um, but then, you know, so that 60 to 80 percent is word of mouth. Um, and that's, you know, through friends of friends. And honestly, I owe a lot of the early days and, and or even now still to my relationships that are built within the music industry. So, you know, everyone's a musician um, once in their life. And then they go on to be project managers or, you know, engineers or whatever it is, you know, or they run fitness places. So um, I was lucky enough to to pick up a camera and then, you know, um, I'm able to help all of those people out, uh, create the content or, you know, branding, whatever it is. Interesting that you say that because mm. I had a conversation just recently with a, a lawyer friend of mine. And he was talking about how now that he's, um, I don't know if he's running his own practice. I think he might have taken over from his parents or something like that. Anyway, he was saying, um, you know, throughout uni and, and whatever else, um, they would encourage them to go to these networking events. And it, they'd be like, you know, you're only as good as your network and... Um, you need to meet people and that's how you get clients and whatever. And he's like, it's only now five or six years or seven years in, whatever he is, that he realizes that that is sort of useful to a point, but he's like the real, the real value of the network is the people I play basketball with on a Wednesday night because they all need yeah. a lawyer at some point in their lives. And, you know, I yeah, he would yeah. go and volunteer down at the community center and help people for yeah. free and through doing that he's met the ceo of this place and then the guy who owns yeah, the fruit exactly. shop and then this and that and he's like it's the the real networking has nothing to do with business it's just the people in your life and then the people in their lives so i think that's really yeah, interesting yeah, exactly. that, that, that you say that because um that's something that has that i've only just thought about and i think i need to take advantage of more in the future yeah for sure. And that's the thing, like someone, you know, even 10%, you know, you just know, you barely know, but they still know of you. They're still more likely to book you rather than someone they don't know, you know? So that's why if you're a friend of a friend or, you know, you met them once at a wedding, like, um, yeah, they're going to have you in their, in their head. And I guess, yeah, when they're thinking about, oh, I need someone to book, well then you will at least be in that pool to pick from you know yep yep so i got married about three months ago something like that first of may it was and um my lights just changed and uh nice. kurt and Cara came down to melbourne and photographed the wedding um first of all i just wanted to share something with you that um zach my brother said um at the end of the wedding i just only thought of it then and I don't know why I haven't said this to you so far <laughs> but um, when we uh, got I think you guys sent you know a dozen of the shots through that night and we were looking through them and whatever the next day and Zach's like I don't even remember most of these photos being taken like I didn't even notice that you guys were there and he said I think ideally that is the best thing you could hope for for a photographer or video person to not notice them and just have them, you know, do their job but not interfere with the day. But you know what yeah. Zach said? He said it was the opposite with Kurt and Kara. He said, I wanted Kurt and Kara to be involved in everything because I felt like they were our friends as well and I felt like they improved the day. Yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to share that with yeah, you. Yeah, that's cool. And Zach's yeah, like, yeah. Uh, Kurt and Kara were so cool. He really enjoyed having you guys part of the process. Zach is my brother, and he was th the best man at the wedding. And I think that uh, I think that I think everyone kind of felt that. I, I feel like you guys were part of the family for the day. Um, so let's start. I just want to share that with you quickly. That's not really a discussion. Yeah, yeah. Oh well, no, maybe it can amazing, be. Yeah. But the uh, yeah. the first thing I wanted to say was there's a fine line between taking on a job for a friend and regretting taking on a job for a friend yeah yeah for sure how do you navigate that but 
that, and that's the thing because it could be your best best mate um, that you that you take a job on, and it could just not work out, you know. Um, and I think that's a, a factor of things, you know, your expectation, their expectation, um, uh, their their trust in you as well. Like I feel like I have had people uh, book me just because I am their mate and I am a photographer, right? But it's not always because of the the, the style that we shoot or or my ability. So I think if, if someone's booking you just because you are their mate, like there is that potential to um, for, for either party to be unhappy, you know, with, with expectations or style or, um, you know, a- anything within those details, I guess. So... Um, yeah, it's, it really depends on the relationship more than the actual job, you know. I think it's more an understanding of, okay, this is this is what I'm going to get. Um, you know, it, that's why if, if someone shows me a style that is completely different to mine and they, they still want to book me, well, then, you know, I have to have a chat to them and say, look, this is obviously my ability or, or you know, what what I can do. Either, yeah, okay, I could match that or whatever. But if I can't, well, then I, I would usually just say, well, I, I don't think I'm the, the person. You know, there's there's so many people out there and I'm happy to, to pass on to someone who I can recommend. You know, I won't just throw them in the dark. It would be more of a conversation to say, hey, look, I would love to do this, but my ability or, or my style isn't the same as probably what you you want. So then, then you'll have to have that discussion and... I don't know, I guess, yeah, I'd, I've recommended people before where I felt like I haven't been able to, I guess, um, produce what, what that client wanted, even though it is your friend, you know. It's like, hey, you're my best mate, I want to help you out, but I'm just not the person for the job. And I think it's it's hard to do that because it's your friend and then also, like, n- not many people would do that either. They'd just want to take the job or, you know, I guess, with the experience, you understand that you don't, you don't need to take on the job, even if it is your best mate as well, you know? So it's like either party has a, has a, um, a part to play in that, you know, whether I do take it on or whether, whatever it is. But in this instance, when you approach me to, sh- you know, to photograph your wedding or ask for, to do your wedding, I was just blown away because, you know, I feel like, you know, a lot of people in the industry, um, you work with photographers all the time. And personally, I was I was flattered because, obviously, you know I, I look up to you a bunch as well um, over the years. You know I've learnt a lot of things just from you posting, um, and yeah, for to be asked, it was it was just it was an honour for us to be down there. You know, I, I remember when you sent me a message. You know, I said to Cara, I'm like, holy shit, PJ is like, you know, asked us to come down, and she, but at that time didn't didn't know of you. Um, and I was just so excited about it, yeah. So I guess for me, it was an easy decision to make as well. And if and I know that in that instance, if you had picked me, then it was for a reason, you know, um, either editing style or relationship or whatever it was. So um, and all I wanted to do was just do my best. So yeah, I guess that yeah, it, it depends. Back back to the original question, yeah, it depends on. Yeah, your abilities and um, expectations, yeah. How much of it, if you had to give a percentage, how much of it is to do with money, do you think? Because I know, I think we're probably similar in the way that we always want to help out our friends. But at the Mm. same time, there is... There is a, dun- a dynamic sometimes where a friend will come to you with the expectation of wanting something for cheap. And yeah. to be completely honest, um, I didn't want mates rates from you and Kara. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. in fact, I have said that to all of our suppliers. And yeah. I think for me, it's because it's only in my in the last few years since we've moved out of home and you know we're just more conscious about um you know 
our bills and our, our money and how we spend money, we want to spend money very deliberately. So I'm not going to walk past the butcher and go and buy meat in the supermarket, you know, or I'm not going to buy yeah. fruit and veg in Aldi when there's a beautiful green grocer just across the road. Yeah. Like yeah. I think to be honest, it's a privilege and I think everyone should feel this way, but unfortunately it's not how the world works, but I think it's a privilege to be able to choose where to spend your money. And if you have a friend who's an accountant, you should be, they should be doing your accounts. Maybe accountant's a bad one because money's a touchy subject. But yeah. if you have a friend who, <laughs> if you have a friend who is a shoemaker, you should be buying your shoes from there. If you have a friend who has yeah. a restaurant, you should be going to their restaurant. Like not because yeah. you're trying to get a deal from them because no, no. You, they're doing their own thing. And, and, you know, we need to, if everyone just is supportive of each other, if everyone, yeah is a little bit more conscious with their money. Like, I feel like it's a privilege that I get to go and give money to my friends who are barbers that cut my hair, you know? Um, yep. I, look, you you look af- you looked after us big time. Um, if you had of, I don't know what you normally charge for a wedding, but yeah, yeah. I would have been whatever number you had told me, I would have been happy. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Because I know that so many times, and I do the exact same thing, so many times we take on a job for our friends. Someone asks us for something. Oh, it's just this. Oh, can you come and take some shots of this? All it is is this. And you give them a price to try and yeah. help them out. And it ends up being so much more than what it is. And, yeah. you know, halfway through the job you just regret it and you just think i've just sold my soul for sure and that that happens and i guess that's again that would be on me a little bit as well for not asking them for for a proper brief or for whatever whereas weddings it's like I, i i'm there the whole time yeah so it's like it can't be any possibly longer or shorter it's like hey I'm there till, you know, from whenever I need to be till, till right at the end. So for a wedding, it's probably different. But for a normal job, yeah, it, it even, yeah, you still get caught out just on stuff like that where it's like, oh, it's only this and it's only that. And then it ends up being a lot more. And, um, you know, every, everyone, I feel like these days I'm more comfortable with saying, hey, look, there's, there was extra work. This is how much it's going to cost. Um, even though initially I might've tried to do them a deal or whatever it is, if I feel like, um, you know, I've, I've obviously put more time in, I'm, I'm way more comfortable now just saying, Hey, this is how much it's going to cost because it, it was this amount of time. This is, these are the reasons why. And everyone is always, you know, they're always happy to pay it. But yeah, in the early days, I would have just sucked it up and just lost whatever the money about money and time was. Um, yeah, it's, it's really tough, but again, yeah, I'm, I've got getting my wedding ring made and, you know, I went to all these different jewelers and all that stuff and they're all the big guys. And then, um, I ended up going with, uh, mate Steve, uh, who was also a mu- musician as well. Um, because I was like, well, you know, what? I'd rather give him my money. Like, and I was like, yeah, same thing. I was like, I don't need mates rates. So like, this is your job. I'm just paying you whatever it's worth, you know, like, yeah. and I'd rather go to him than just go to Michael Hill or wh- wherever those places are because a, you know, you, you need to support your mates and the, the whole idea of mates rates just, I, d- I don't know. I think that that should just be phased out. Like, you know, uh, I don't know. I just feel like it comes back around, you know, um, and mates rates just isn't, yeah, I guess also it's like what what is what's your understanding of mates' rates, you know? Because a lot of times, if you're a tradie or whatever it is, it's like, oh, I'll give you um, a carton of beers for for your time, you know? And a carton of beers is what I don't, I don't, I don't drink, so I don't know, like fifty, sixty bucks or whatever, right? And it's like if if they've just plumbed h- half your house for a carton of beer, like I don't I don't reckon it's worth it, you know? So um, that's why, yeah. If I was a tradie, I just wouldn't even tell anyone. I'd just, <laughs> I'd just make up. I'm doing something else. No, I'm just a whatever else. Yeah, 
so then you didn't have to get roped in. Like my brother's a plumber and, you know, when he was living close to everyone, it was just every weekend, you know, this guy or this guy needs something. And, you know, it takes time away from his family, from whatever it is, you know, from whatever he's doing. And he's getting paid less than he would if he was a, pro- a proper job. So, um, yeah, I think there's a fine line and I, f- I feel like it's important to call people out on it as well. You know, if it's like, hey, look, I was doing, I was helping you out. This is, this is not, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to do it. Not because I don't like it, just because it's, it's a lot of work, you know. Yeah. And I feel like if it was on the opposite hand and you asked them to do something, a lot of the time they wouldn't do it. So um, kind of nice, nice people get taken advantage of a lot of the time and, um, you know, end up with out time or money for, for their efforts. So, mm. Mm. yeah, it's just it's tough. It's to be honest for me, it's mind blowing to think that, yeah, like use the plumber analogy. You could call up someone from Google, right? And pay $2,000 for a job. Or yeah. you could call up your mate who has a plumber's business and try and get away with paying him a couple hundred bucks for the job. But yeah. it's like, it's, you, if you didn't have that mate, you would be paying a complete stranger 10 times the price. Why wouldn't you yeah. both win, <laughs> you get the job done and then you can put money in your friend's pocket and, you know, yeah, the world the world keeps spinning. You know, I, I don't understand that. Yeah. You know, even on a smaller level, I used to work a retail job. I used to work at a shoe shop. And as soon as I got that job, you know, in whatever it was, 2011 or something, when I started working there, everyone started hitting me up for discounts and free shoes yeah. and, and whatever yeah. else. And it's like, that's not like, first of all, I'm just a pawn in the game. I can't do that. Yeah. But you don't can, get any, any like value out of doing that either. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or what they should have done is said, oh, okay, his shoes are 200 bucks. I'm going to pay 150, then give you the 50 cash. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because yeah. of the, because of the same, same way that they're still paying the exact 200, but you're, they're helping you out because you know, you're their mate. Yeah I, don't, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, I, I can't see why you wouldn't just help out your mate, you know. And for for the times where I do get mates rates for stuff, you know, I'm always just so appreciative and it's like, well, anything I can do, but, you know, 100% of the time, you can't really return the favor anyway. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh, you appreciate it and, you know, next time you're out, you, you know, you buy him a drink or whatever. But I f- still feel like, um, yeah, it's really hard to repay that, you know, unless they're, it's a clean, you know, swap for something else or whatever it is. Yeah, it's like, some, yeah, not everyone has the ability to help someone else out as well, you know, for what they need. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 an honour to be able to help out friends when you can see it. it well, f- yeah, for me, it's like, I want to be there anyway, you know. It, it wasn't, well, in, in this case, you know, I was like, oh, man, I want to be there. And that, I think that's a big part of the reason why, you know, your brother probably made that comment to say that, you know, we felt like a part of the family. It's because we genu- genuinely do, you know, and I, and that's why I guess weddings is so different from commercial or any other, um, any other job that I do. It's because literally I am, I'm, I'm there like longer than anyone for the whole day. So if me and Cara are there, yeah, we literally feel like family. Everyone's always, um, you know, so generous and um, just want to look after you, which is, yeah, which is cool because technically I'm just, we're just working, right? Like we're just, yeah, technically you're the client. I'm just doing my job. But the fact that I get to actually like, yeah, your your wedding was just, it was probably more... I'm not going to say more loving, but it was just such this sense of family that like, I guess we've probably never experienced in our life. Like Cara has a big family, but, um, I don't know, man, it was, it was, it was something special. It really was. Yeah. Um, so for us to, to be there and yeah, I, I don't think money ever came into like, even when you hit me up, it was like my money was n- never, in, in my head, you know, it was just like, okay, what, what do I need to do to be there? You know, because yeah, of that, I guess, relationship with you that I respect you. I think you're a legend, you know, and for me, it's an honor to be there to actually, you know, create something for you guys. Mm. Well, 
another thing that I wanted to say about the wedding day was watching you shoot my wedding from a client's perspective. Um, it made me realize I've tried so hard to avoid shooting weddings for so long. Like I've done two or three mm -hmm. because, you know, you have to <laughs> as a photographer. Yeah, yeah. But I, yeah, yeah. I've someone's, done, someone's asked you and you've gone, oh, yeah, I've got a camera. Yeah, let's, uh, let's give it a go. I've done two or three. I've done a couple for Jared, who, who I work for. One where I yep. was just second shooter for him. One where I just shot it for him. Yep. And I've done one for a friend of mine who I tried so hard to handball it to someone else and I gave all these different recommendations. But she said, yep. you know, it's, re it's really important that I have you to shoot my wedding. And she said, tell yep. me how much you need, all of this, whatever. She's like, we don't trust, know or trust anyone else. We really want you. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I really appreciated that. And I ended up having a really good experience. But even still, I've tried to avoid weddings like the plague because mm. there is a lot of work. It's a huge day. And to be honest, probably a lot of the stuff that we've just talked about, because if it's your friend, you know, perhaps I've been too afraid to offend them by asking yeah. for yeah. what a wedding is worth and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah. having seen you guys shoot my wedding and i i think that we also tried to do i don't think it was necessarily an easy wedding but we tried to do everything that we could to make it as easy as it could be and we tried to yeah you know we, we tried to, i tried to structure it the way that i would want to shoot it you know do all the yeah. photos first and whatever and all that stuff anyway um seeing the way that you guys handled it and the way that you guys operated and especially you in particular Kurt um, maybe just because I didn't have as much to do on the night with Cara personally but yeah. um, nothing was too difficult and mm. I think the generation of photographers before us they they live with these constraints in their minds and with their gear and with the way they shoot. And if something is not on that run sheet or if something was not agreed upon beforehand or if the light's not doing the right thing, then all of a sudden everything can, it, it's too hard. And I feel like part of what I was talking about before with the new generation of photographers, and I think, I honestly think it has something it has a little bit to do with the equipment that we use and that you use mm -hmm. um yeah you know for me when i'm shooting a wedding or in the past when i've done it on my canon cameras the constant struggle is getting the shot in focus for me yeah 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 looking looking at the way that you shot my wedding that tipped me over the edge to say it's time I can't keep hanging on yeah. to this this uh, this Canon DSLR. It's time yeah, to move yeah, across sure. because the way, yeah. not just personally, but technically the way that, that you guys made it look easy and feel easy, I was like, that is how photography should be done. That's how wedding should be shot. And yeah, yeah. a month later or whatever, a couple of months later, I um, sold my Canon kit and I, and I moved into Sony. Um, so yeah. I think for the next episode, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions about how I can be shooting yeah, better on Sony and, and what you do yeah. with your Sony kits because you, I feel like you were very, very early on that bandwagon. Yeah. Well, I was because yeah, yeah, we can talk about it another time, but yeah, like the first camera I had was a, a Sony mirrorless camera. Um, and then it wasn't until... A year later that I ended up having a Canon, you know, 5D in my hand, um, which just felt like a piece of shit. So <laughs> it was just, yeah, I had the, I had the as issues early days when I shot some weddings on the 5D, man. And that's what made me stop using it um, was that it just would not, it just missed focus like on where, where I wanted to focus. Yeah. So, um, and, I, and I feel like that's the thing yeah man you should shoot whatever you want to shoot and not not be afraid of it you know because you trust your gear or you trust your process um and yeah for me a big thing of 
w why I'm able to shoot the way I shoot in studio, in wherever, weddings, is because of my gear. Like, I have so much confidence in it that I know I've got the shot. Like, and that's the thing. I, I want to, I don't want to feel like we're there to take photos. You know, I want to feel like we're there to do whatever it is, you know, whether it's a wedding or it's sports or whatever. I just want everything to run as normal because, yeah, uh, I don't, with the gear I have, I don't need to be like traditional photographers where you'd you'd go away for a wedding um, photo shoot or whatever it was, you know, I'd take two two hours out, out of the day or whatever it is um, and they're constantly checking the back of their well, I'm just going to use Canon as an example, you know, to, to check, oh, I've, you know, you would see, and this is before I was a photographer, I would always see if I was at a wedding, you know, they'd take one, two, three, and then they'd look at the back, one, two, three, look at the back, look at the back, always looking at the back. And it's like, yeah, yeah, obviously with the gear I have, I don't ever, honestly, I don't check the back at ever. And I don't really review anything because I know, like I have that confidence, okay, ne next next shot, like, you know, I know how awkward it is standing there, um, whether it's at a wedding or whatever, like even models, like that's their job, but they still don't want to be standing there forever in the one outfit or the whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say, yeah, I wouldn't be afraid of weddings. And a lot of people are because they probably don't have that confidence in their gear or, or they think that, you know, someone's going to be a bridezilla, but yeah, I've, literally only had maybe two bad experiences over the over the last say five years or with um with with a wedding where they just haven't been happy with the way they've looked but um that that wasn't something that i could personally chat change i guess um that yeah. was that was uh, uh, just a different issue i guess so um i can only capture what's there on the day and um Plus. you know if, if if it needs to be super photoshopped or anything like that it's it, that's not something that i traditionally would provide so um yeah again you know that was early days and that was um you know again it was like you know through a friend of a friend or or a client you know where it's it's one of those jobs where i'm doing it for nothing and then it ends up just <laughs> being that nightmare that you talked about you know um so yeah, I feel I feel like man, and that that can happen at any point. Like you could be working for the biggest client in the world, and it can go south. Like it's it's just trying to manage that expectation, um, with no matter what client you're working with, you know. Expectation. And I think I think you hit the nail on the head there with expectation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Certainly in in that situation, I don't know what it was, and I don't want to go into it, but um sometimes people just have this this view you know this highly curated view of what they look like because of the photos of themselves that they have released into the world but in reality yeah if someone doesn't look like that you can't make them look like that you know you you, you can no. only and the thing about the wedding is you're set up for success right you've got hair and makeup and a beautiful dress and a lovely suit yeah. and whatever you you've got all the elements to to make it look fantastic but at the end of the day you still look how you look yeah yeah for sure and th that i also enjoy weddings because you know everyone's looking a million bucks they've usually there's got a stylist that's decked the place out like catering it's like it's literally the best thing you could ever shoot because everything is is perfect you know for for that wedding and um it's just the best situation. So I, I love it. And, and the, the, you know, should be the happiest they've ever been on that day. So, I mean, they're smiling, they look great, you know? So if you're not happy with, with something, or well, then I feel like it, it's, you know, maybe the finger isn't pointed at, at the photographer or videographer, unless, yeah, they're just not great at their job. And then that, I guess, then that should have been something that you looked at before you booked them. You know, it's, it's like anything, you know, I'm not going to go to, a uh you know a breakfast place that i haven't looked at you know on their menu uh, online and then rock up and then go oh this menu is not not what i wanted and it's like yeah. well <laughs> yeah it's pretty easy to research stuff these days with the internet yeah yeah i want to leave that uh 
start to wrap up here, but I want to leave that with a quote that I heard recently. I can't remember where it was from. I think it was Sean Sean Tucker. Have you ever heard of a, of a, of a photographer called Sean Tucker? He's a YouTuber. I have. I don't know where. Yeah, YouTube. He's like very interesting guy, super introverted. He was an ex. He was training to become a priest or maybe he even was a priest. And then yep. he started doing photography because he needed to make a little bit of extra on the side. Anyway, he's got a really interesting YouTube channel. And I heard him say recently, the most important spec on any piece of gear is that it can get out of the way and not be... Oh, I'm butchering the quote, but basically the, 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 <laughs> the bit of gear can get out of the way and it's just you and the photo. You don't have to think. There, yeah. There's not something blocking in between. There's not something... Uh, there's not another hurdle in between you guys, yeah. I guess. Um, and I yeah. think you just reminded me of that when you were talking about you just have the confidence in your gear. You're not looking at the back. You know if you've got the shot, onto the next one. The most important spec is just for the camera to get out of the way. Yeah, yeah. One more thing I want to do... Um, Jeremy and I used to do this and I think it's uh, interesting for someone watching and I'm curious to know personally. Um, tool of the week, it's called. What's your uh, What's your favorite bit of gear? What's something at the moment that you have just been getting a lot of joy and um, a lot of utility out of? Uh, it's something that I've uh, learned to love and that, is so i recently got the 24 to 70 g master lens um it's, it's f 2.8 uh previously you know when i first started i had very strong opinions on zoom lenses and uh obviously yeah i was like oh primes or nothing like all those guys using zoom lenses suck um but it's been so versatile uh just to have that faster aperture as well whereas i already have the 24 to 105 but it's only f4 so yeah. they're very similar lenses but also very different different so i feel like for weddings and just general events the 24 to 70 is is a lot better than the 24 to 105 because it's got you know the couple of stops a lot better um seems to work really well focus is okay um but i feel like that's something that i've it's taken me years to finally put in the bag because of my yeah just disagreement with zoom lenses like i just i don't know it was it was it's just a thing i mean there's yeah these people on the high horses which i was <laughs> about primes you know it's like shoot primes or go home yeah um, but yeah what about you uh my tool of the week is the little um it's a little sony remote um rbt something something it's just yeah. It's so simple. It's just this little Bluetooth remote, but as soon as you turn the camera on, it just connects and it works. You can um, yeah, that's good. do the uh, remote shutter. You can even change, yeah. put custom settings. And um, for me, it's been absolutely unreal. Um, we do a lot of yeah. interiors, um, commercial property, um, a lot mm. of stuff on a tripod and um, to not be connected to the camera. I, I used to have a cable shutter release. Um, it's yeah. absolutely changed my life. And even even just in the studio on on a product shoot, you know, you yeah you get up and you move something around on the set, and to be able to snap it from where I am is mm. absolutely game changing. And for a hundred bucks or whatever it was, um, yeah, I'm absolutely in love with that bit of gear. Anyway, that's yeah. it. Now, now now you're saying that I need to get one. Yeah, you've sold me. Yeah, you, you because should. that's the, the thing. Usually on Capture One, I'll be clicking on the mouse pad, which is like I'm right at the action, but. Um, it'd be so much better if it's just in my hand and I'm walking around, right? Mm. It's really good and see how you go because I found I found it really difficult to get my hands on one. All of the camera shops. Yeah, okay. I mean, we can talk about how bad Australian camera shops are um, in another <laughs> episode, but all of the camera shops yeah. have it listed on their website, but no one actually has it in Australia. In stock, yeah. Um, mm. So I found it difficult to get one, um, but see how you go you're probably more connected in the sony in the sony world than i am yeah yeah so yeah someone will have them mate thank you so much um for the first episode I, i'm super happy we've tested the concept um 
I'm sure the the video looks amazing. Um, I can't wait to to get in the uh, get into Resolve and, and put it together. I, I really appreciate you joining yeah. me. Um, for the people at home, uh, let us know what your Instagram handle is so we can go and check you out. Uh, Kurtogram, K U R T O G R A M. That's Kurtogram. it. Kurtogram, beautiful. Anything else you wanna? you want to plug or you want to, you want to end with no nah, no nah, nothing to plug no nah, just uh happy to have a chat and um yeah let's do it again awesome mate we'll uh we'll leave it there thank you so much for watching i don't know how to finish this because i don't have a name for this podcast yet <laughs> um i've been pj you can find me on instagram or pretty much anywhere on the internet at pj p-a-n-t-e-l-i-s give me a big fat thumbs up on this video if you enjoyed it don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you next time. Bye.